Today, we're looking at why Hondas are so reliable. In fact, Hondas are so valuable that they're also some of the most stolen cars in America. Stick around to find out what I mean, because today we're looking at Honda innovations, reliability ratings, resale value, and repair costs. So let's just dive in and see what makes Hondas great. Did you know that Honda is the biggest manufacturer of internal combustion engines in the world? Each year they make more than 14 million combustion engines. They're also the world's eighth largest car maker. They built a reputation and track record of dependable, reliable cars. The average Honda vehicle lasts 209,000 miles. So what's the secret in their sauce? It's a no-brainer that Honda has high engineering standards and top-notch manufacturing processes. For example, Honda requires its vehicle parts to fit more tightly than most automakers, ensuring they don't wear down as quickly from grinding against each other. But it's much more than that. There are a few more factors that led Honda to become one of the most reliable brands in the world. One key was their beginning and the person behind the name. So Ichiro, founder of the Honda company, had no formal education. As a youth, he had no interest in school, and he spent most of his time helping his father repair bicycles. He loved tinkering with mechanical things. As a teenager, he went from his small village to Tokyo to work as an apprentice to a mechanic, and then returned to start his own company when he was just 22 years old. So Ichiro's approach to business and innovation extends to Honda's company operating philosophy down to even today. We we can see it reflected in Honda's accomplishments. Often, Honda's engineering and manufacturing advances came ahead of its time. For the full story, check out my previous video on the history of Honda. But today, we'll just touch on some of their boasting rights. For example, 40 years ago, in 1982, Honda set the record with their second generation Accord. It was the first foreign car to be made on American soil. That was way back in 1982 when Honda built their Marysville, Ohio plant, and the Accord remains one of the best selling passenger cars in America down to today. Nowadays, it's very common for car makers to use variable valve timing on their engines. But did you know that Honda was the first car maker to use it in a production vehicle? That was back in 1983. They went on to develop VTEC to boost their engine efficiency and power, eventually leading to some of the most iconic engines America has ever seen. Same thing with turbochargers. Honda was among the earliest adopters of turbochargers. They've been using turbos longer than most car makers. Starting in the 80s with the City 2 Turbo, the Vamo sliding door van, Life Dunk, and the first generation Acura RDX. Honda was also the first Japanese car maker to create a unique luxury brand. In fact, its early success ended up moving Toyota and Nissan to follow suit and launched their own luxury brands, Lexus and Infiniti. And don't forget, Honda was the first to make hydrogen and hybrid cars. Of course, many people assume the first hybrid was the Toyota Prius since it's so popular today. But actually, the Honda Insight debuted before the Prius and was the first hybrid car to be introduced to the United States. In fact, they were one year ahead. Honda was also the first car maker to introduce hydrogen cars to the United States. That was back in 2008 with the Honda FDX Clarity. So you can see how Sorichiro Honda's philosophy on innovation carried on through Honda's history down to today. Another reason for Honda's reputation of reliability is the Japanese culture. You can't just ignore it or take it out of the equation. Japanese culture values order, teamwork, and self-improvement. That means hard work and loyalty. It also means attention to detail, focus, and precision. It's no surprise that this kind of work ethic and company philosophy means good quality cars. But it's not just cars. Many people know that Honda makes motorcycles, but few people know they also make watercraft, ATVs, mountain bikes, lawn equipment, and solar cells. Honda even makes private jet aircraft. The HA420 is powered, of course, by Honda engines. Honda also created a humanoid robot called Asimo. Honda even has its own airport. It's located in Japan near its main plant. As you can see, Honda doesn't like to sit still. They have a broad span across various engineering technologies, and they're all about innovation. But now let's talk about some of the most reliable Honda cars. Did you know that the Honda Fit is ranked as the fifth most reliable vehicle according to one index? And of course, on the list is a Honda Civic, which has proven reliable over many decades, with tens of millions already sold across the world. 
Consumer Reports considers the Honda Civic Coupe the most reliable variant, and the Civic Coupe has received a lot of praise. And then you have the Honda Accord, which is now in its 10th generation, and still ranks high for reliability. Another reliable Honda car is the Insight, a four-door, five-passenger hybrid electric hatchback. It's one of the most fuel-efficient gas-powered cars in U.S. history. They do tend to be expensive, but they have low average repair costs. Also on the list is the Honda CRV. The CRV's reliability ratings aren't as high as other other Honda cars and the repair costs can sometimes be high, but it's still much more dependable than other cars on the market. It's not just brand new Hondas that are reliable, old ones are too. That's why Honda is one of the top car manufacturers to have some of the best resale values. What do you think the other two top brands that have the highest rated values? Well, if you guessed Toyota and Subaru, you'd be correct. So let's say you bought a brand new car. After five years of ownership, an average car typically holds just 35% of its original price. But if your car is a Honda, Toyota, Subaru, its average resale value can be up to 62%. These three cars might be neck to neck, but they fare much better than other car brands. Just for kicks, you can look at resale value after three years and seven years. Honda, 77% after three years and 47% after seven years. Toyota, 74% after three years and 50% after seven years. And Subaru is 77% after three years and 49% after seven years. So why is Honda's resale value so high? Well, first of all, it's the name. The Honda Honda brand means value because they have a good track record. Hondas are a good value in terms of performance, efficiency, and affordability. Hondas offer craftsmanship and safety. They also have low ownership costs in terms of maintenance and repairs. So when you buy a brand new Honda, it's not just a great choice for reliability, it's also a good investment. So which Honda models have the best resale values? The Honda sedan cars with the best resale value include the Honda Insight and the Civic. If you're looking for a minivan, a good bet is the Honda. Honda Odyssey. For SUV, it's the Honda HRV. Or for trucks, it's the Honda Ridgeline. Let's look at the Honda Civic. A new Civic starts a bit over $21,000. After five years, its resale value will be almost $13,000. So it'll lose a bit over $8,000 because of depreciation, which is inevitable in any car. But the good news is that the Civic will still keep almost 59% of its original value. That's excellent. Because remember, compared to the average car, which only keeps 35% of its value. Or look at a new Honda Accord, which can start at $27,000. At year five, its resale value is almost $15,000. That means it depreciated only $12,000. In other words, it still keeps almost 53% of its original value. It's good to look at reliability ratings and resale values, but don't forget the average annual maintenance and repair costs. I'm talking about the average cost, frequency, and severity of repairs. When you're considering buying any used car, it behooves you to consider how much you can expect in repair costs, how often, and how severe. Honda cars have a relatively low average annual repair cost. Honda's average is just $428 compared to the overall car market average of $652. For example, the Honda Civic has an average annual repair cost of $368. The average repair frequency of a Honda is 0.3 times a year. In other words, one once every three years. The severity rating for all Honda models across the board is just 10%. It shows the brand is quite reliable. This means that most Honda cars that need a repair have non-urgent problems that are relatively easy to fix and are affordable. And here's an interesting angle to look at, theft. They say thieves only steal what's valuable. That's why car theft can be an interesting way to look at a brand's value and reputation. Did you know that two of the most stolen cars in America are the Honda Civic and the Honda Accord? Partly because thieves understand their value. Interestingly enough, the 1997 Accords remain the most stolen model year, even though they're over 20 years old. That's a testimony on how good these cars are. Well, that, and actually, the 1997 Accords were built with a fatal flaw. As the ignitions in these cars age, it becomes so imprecise that anything can fit in a keyhole, like the handle of a spoon, and it's enough to start the engine. Anyway, we've seen many angles on why Honda is so popular and so loved. It's because they're high quality, have a low cost of ownership, and maintain durability. Certainly, no one brand is absolutely perfect, but most professional organizations and consumers attest that Honda is among the cream of the crop. Reliability ratings for Honda cars typically rate above average and are consistently in the top tier for all around reliability as a brand. The story started several decades ago with Yukiyashu Togo. He was the president of Toyota Motor Sales USA. One day, he realized that most of his successful friends and colleagues owned Mercedes and BMWs, but few considered buying a Toyota. 
Toyota had a solid reputation of building quality cars, and its production was considered one of the best in the world. But there was no singular car in Toyota's lineup that carried an image of prestige, wealth, or social status. And here's why. There was the famous oil crisis in the 1970s. It caused fuel prices to skyrocket, and that caused consumers to turn their attention to Japanese cars, since they were inexpensive and economical. So as a result, Japanese car sales grew in the US and European markets. This further fed the perception that Japanese cars were reliable and had better fuel economy. In the United States, Toyotas become generally associated with pickups. By the 80s, the economy recovered, people became financially comfortable again, and were able to buy cars that cost more. In people's minds, Toyota was the economy and mainstream category. It wasn't considered to be in the class of high-end or luxury car. Togo believed that Toyota could build a true luxury car, one that would fit a high-end lifestyle, a car of the highest quality, no worse than Mercedes-Benz. He was confident that it would succeed. In August 1983, at a confidential meeting of Toyota Corporation's Board of Directors, Chairman Aiji Toyota voiced Togo's idea. But Yukiya Sotogo's idea was received with more skepticism than enthusiasm. Creating a new luxury brand would mean spending more money on resources and production. But to meet consumer demand, the company decided to take the bold step. Toyota set a goal to surpass the best luxury cars in speed, economy, weight, aerodynamics, and noise, or lack thereof. And they dared to achieve all of that without reducing quality and reliability. They aimed to launch a new era for Toyota. In 1984, they began Project F1 with all ideas, goals, and objectives for the development of a premium car. The name F1 had nothing to do with Formula One. Instead, the letter F in the code name stood for flagship, and the number one referred to the goal of being a luxury sedan of the highest class. The first of its kind to exceed quality while being affordable. The project name reflected their ambitions. The main engineers of the project were Shoichi Jimbo and Ichiro Suzuki. It involved a total of 60 designers, 1,400 engineers, 2,300 technicians, and 220 auxiliary workers. By the end of Project F1, about 450 prototypes had been designed, with the cost of the project exceeding $1 billion. In May 1985, the development of a luxury car prototype was in full swing. Toyota did large-scale research on the luxury car market in the USA. That year, some designers and developers rented a house in Laguna Beach, California, to explore the taste and lifestyle of premium car buyers in the United States. Their studies found that the popular premium cars had lower performance characteristics than expected, scoring just fourth place out of five. The thing that was most important to consumers was brand prestige and image, high quality materials, and attractive design. So after this study, the chief engineer, Ichiro Suzuki, knew that two criteria he should focus on the most, exceptional performance and a unique stylish design. But the developers faced an almost impossible task. To achieve one feature of the car meant you had to sacrifice another. For example, to reduce fuel consumption, you need to reduce the weight of the car. But to reduce engine noise, you need more soundproofing material, which adds weight to the car. So now you have a conflict and you have to find a compromise. And it's a a vicious circle. Here's another example. Luxury cars need to be elegant and have aesthetic appeal, but optimizing aerodynamics impacts the overall design of the car. Suzuki was convinced that these conflicts could be resolved without needing to compromise, and he succeeded. For the noise and weight problem, he reasoned you could eliminate the cause of the noise instead of working to eliminate the consequences of a noisy engine. But to approach it from that angle, he needed to design a completely different engine. Suzuki took advantage of being the chief engineer of the new project. He was able to persuade the chief equipment engineer of Toyota to create one experimental engine according to Suzuki's drawings. The company's leading experts assembled it by hand and the results were impressive. The engine had lower vibrations and therefore minimal noise and it had noteworthy fuel economy because of the size. In July 1985, they assembled the first prototype. There were many opinions about the name choice. They saw the value of keeping it under the Toyota brand, while others suggested creating a new brand specific to the luxury line. They finally decided on a new brand name and a new sales channel to give the car an opportunity to create a fresh image in consumers' minds, rather than being associated with the image and perception of its parent, Toyota. 
There are several different stories of how the Lexus name was chosen. According to one story, the team held brainstorming sessions and came up with 219 possible names. The names Alexis and Celsius took the lead. Alexis got more votes, but then many people associated with the name of the heroine, Alexis Carrington Colby, in the TV series Dynasty. So they came up with an idea to modify it into something similar, eventually landing on Lexus. According to another story, the word Lexus was invented by adding the word luxury and elegance. Some people believe that Lexus is a modification of the Latin word Luxus. Yet another theory is that Lexus was an acronym that stood for Luxury Exports to the U.S. Later, in an interview with Team One, the ad agency for the brand said the name Lexus didn't have any particular meaning and that it simply connoted luxury and technology. In 1985, the first prototype for Lexus LS400 appeared. The LS stood for luxury sedan and the 400 stood for its four liter engine. If you think that Lexus went into production immediately, thereafter. Well, that's an overestimation. These incredibly industrious workers spent another four years perfecting the creation. In 1986, the LS400 passed road tests in Germany, Canada, and Sweden. It overcame snowdrifts while maneuvering on winding mountain roads. The test results led to the improvement of the steering and suspension system. In May 1987, after eight different designs were presented, the management team finally approved one body design. And so on January 2nd, 1988, after years of development, Lexus, as a brand and a car, was introduced at the Los Angeles Auto Show. In January 1989, at the Detroit Motor Show, the world saw the first Lexus models, the LS400 and ES250. ES stood for executive sedans, and 250 stood for its 2.5 liter engine. The LS400 received praise for its excellent handling, ergodynamic interior, engine performance, build quality, aerodynamics, fuel economy, and cost. Previously, what was thought to be impossible had become possible. The the LS400 engine turned out to be unusually quiet, with minimal vibrations. It was a huge milestone for the company. In fact, they took advantage of that as a key marketing message. One of the first Lexus ads showed a stacked pyramid of delicate champagne glasses on the hood of the car. Then the car accelerated quickly and reached the maximum speed of 145 miles an hour. Yet, even at that engine speed, fast gear changes, the engine produced virtually no vibration. The glass pyramid remained intact on the Lexus hood. They didn't slide off or tip over. There wasn't a single spill. After six months of sales, in February 1990, the U.S. media recognized the Lexus LS400 as the best imported car in the market. No other car model in the world had ever experienced such a triumphant start. Since 1991, the LS400 topped customer satisfaction rating for five consecutive years, and they still hold that record today. In 1992, Lexus overtook European competitors like Mercedes-Benz, BMW, and Jaguar in the U.S. sales. The LS400 became the number one premium import model. It came as a huge shock to German automakers that a brand new brand could surpass them so soon. In fact, it was a large blow to BMW and Mercedes, who lost 29% 19% of their sales. The Lexus LS400 soon became known as the Japanese Mercedes. In 1999, which was 10 years after it entered the market, the one millionth Lexus got sold in the U.S. And that's how the car made its way into the American market. But it's one thing to create a good car and another thing to create a good dealer network in the car industry. Lexus aimed to make the life of its customers more luxurious, and it achieved that. For instance, in 89, they got complaints from two customers about faulty wiring. So the company voluntarily recalled all 8,000 units that had been sold. The car maker organized a 20-day operation with the dealerships whereby the employees picked up cars and repaired it. The company also organized flights and services even in remote places where clients lived. Now that's customer service and the press noticed too. The incident gave the new company a strong reputation for high-level customer service. The company went on to promise that Lexus dealers would treat customers as guests. To prove it, they offered customers a servicing program. And any customer whose car was being repaired or serviced would be given an equivalent vehicle in the interim. They also provided emergency roadside assistance 24-7, which included getting gas delivered to you if it ran out on the road. They also offered shuttling services and car washing. These side services helped reinforce the image of a luxury brand so that customers would have no complaints or regrets about buying a Lexus. Lexus demanded the impossible in order to create the ideal. That's why today Lexus remains one of the leaders in the luxury sector selling it in some 70 countries. They created a reputation and perception when they entered the market, and that image still resonates in consumers' minds untarnished.
Today it's common to see Japanese luxury cars on the road, but back in the 1970s and early 80s it wasn't like that. Those years were turbulent times for the U.S. automotive market. Gasoline shortages and economic downturn changed Americans' views against large luxury cars. Consumer interests shifted more towards economical, reliable cars that required cheaper maintenance and repairs. And the car makers that offered all that were Japanese brands, which made cars that were minimalistic and simple. Among them, Honda stood out especially. Honda had earned a reputation for reliability, fuel efficiency, and low prices that many competitors envied. Even the cheapest model from this brand did not compromise in quality. Honda had experienced significant sales growth. There was something else that helped Honda become a leader in the car market. Japanese companies, including Honda, were selling cars in the U.S. market, but assembling them in Japan. But Honda made a different move. They became the first Japanese manufacturer to assemble cars in the United States. It was a groundbreaking move. They set up a new plant in Ohio in 1980, and it's still there. I've been there. It's quite amazing. Honda's most popular models were the Civic Accord and the Prelude. The most expensive Honda Accord sold for around $10,000. The design was so simplistic that it lacked features such as power windows and leather upholstery. At the time, Mercedes, BMW, and Audi dominated the luxury market worldwide. But Honda had one important advantage, their assembly plant in the United States. By 1981, Honda began designing a new car for the luxury market. It was to be a sedan larger than the Accord with Honda's first ever V6 engine. But they had one huge problem. The generation of Americans who grew up with Honda cars during the economic crisis associated the Honda brand with the economy class. It would be an uphill battle to change that perception to luxury. Any words like premium and luxury together with the word Honda just confused people. Honda developed a new sedan called the HX, which would later be called the Legend. The HX model was their vehicle to compete with Mercedes-Benz, Volvo, BMW, and others. It had a 24-valve V6 engine with electronic fuel injection. Its independent suspension on four-wheel disc brakes promised the handling of a European sports sedan. The interior had all the comforts you'd expect on a premium car, including air conditioning, anti-lock brakes, electrical accessories, and a premium stereo system. It also had a driver's side air bag and speed sensitive power steering. The price point was $20,000, almost double the base price of the Accord in those days. The main mechanical difference between the Legend versus Toyota Mazda and Nissan sedans was that this car was a front wheel drive car. The design of the Legend was finished in 1982. Of course, any new endeavor always carries a certain amount of risk. But to associate a new brand with luxury when it only had one model in stock was double the risk. Honda realized the risks, and they took no chances. The company needed guaranteed success, not just a wild bet. So, Honda decided to create another car that would rank below the HX, but without weakening the image of the luxury and performance that it needed. This new car was called Integra. It had a 16-valve four-cylinder engine with twin camshafts, an electric fuel injection system, a sophisticated chassis set up and attractive styling. The Integra made the statement that the car maker was not just luxury sedans, but also premium sport coupes. The Integra competed with the Volkswagen GTI, and its style, technology, and performance complemented the HX and the new division. So having the second model under their belt put them in a better position. But still, there was another big risk. Honda's marketing team had a big decision to make. How do you convince potential buyers to choose a luxury car from Honda? After all, most buyers weren't interested in paying more for a car with the Honda H logo. That's why in 1984, Honda executives made the decision to launch the new luxury division with its own unique name, unassociated with the Honda name, so that it could stand on its own. But how do you create a name from scratch? So there was an American design company called Name Lab. They're naming experts. That's what they do. They create names for companies and products. Most people haven't heard of this company, but you've certainly heard of some of the names they created. For example, AutoZone, Nissan Sentra, Chevy Lumina, GMC Savannah, and Compaq. Naming is a whole science of its own and can involve psychologists, linguists, and semanticists. Here's how Nameland tackled the naming project for Honda. After several brainstorming sessions and meetings, they finally landed on the word Acu which is a Latin word meaning mechanically precise or made with precision. They use this word as the basis to create a new word and name. The Acura logo, according to Honda, represents a vernier caliper. A caliper is a tool used for making high precision measurements, so you can see how it fits with the name. People usually see how it forms a stylized letter A for Acura, although some people also say they see a skewed letter H as a hidden affinity with its parent company Honda. Hey, that's what I always saw. Now this isn't the original logo, but it has been in use since 1990. 
In November 1984, a secret meeting was held at the Hilton Anatole Hotel in Dallas. This meeting brought together potential dealers and Honda executives in America. At the meeting, a dealership network plan for Acura was unveiled, and it laid out the requirements for potential dealers. First, they needed to have capital to build a new dealership. New dealerships needed to be separate from existing Honda dealerships, and they could not even be geographically close to them. They also had to differ in appearance from Honda dealerships, and not just the physical appearance. Each dealership needed to have a dedicated customer service center. The strategy was to show consumers that buying an Acura wasn't just about buying an expensive Honda car, but that it was a long-term relationship and an experience. The target key markets were Los Angeles, New York, Seattle, and other cities with high sales of luxury goods per capita. In November 1985, the Acura dealerships were operating in full swing in the United States. In Japan, at the Honda Tochigi Test Track, a group of American journalists from car magazines were given the opportunity to drive the Legend and Integra for the first time. The purpose was to let them experience the difference between Honda and Acura products, and they sure did. They noticed the difference in driving experience. In fact, Motor Trend magazine said they disagreed with some popular automotive media who remained skeptical about the viability of Japanese luxury brand. They thought that the odds of Acura success was heavily in Honda's favor, and they believed that the Acura Legend was a terrific debut car. Journalists who test drove the Acura noted that the new sedan was not a copy of a European or American premium car, nor was it a repeat of a larger sedan model sold at the time by Toyota and Nissan. Car and Driver magazine said that in truth it was a new approach to the market. The Integra received favorable news too. On March 27, 1986, a division of the Honda Motor Group called the Acura Automotive Division officially opened in the United States. Despite success in the U.S. market, believe it or not, Acura brand isn't present in Europe or even Japan itself. That's because the company considers their primary markets to be the U.S., Mexico, and China. By the end of the first year, Acura had sold 52,869 cars and had grown to 150 dealerships. In 1987, sales continued to climb, with Acura announcing sales of 109,470 cars that year. This wasn't just double the previous year's sales, but it also surpassed all sales of European luxury car brands in the United States combined. By the end of 1987, Acura had already established itself as a luxury brand with an award-winning lineup of sedans and coupes. The Integra and the classic Legend Coupe, which were added to the lineup in 1987, were named the Car and Driver's Top 10 List. And the Legend Coupe was voted by Motor Trend as the best import car of 1987. Road and Track selected the Legend Coupe as one of the 10 best cars in the world. And of course, a significant mark of success was when Toyota and Nissan noticed and announced plans to create their own luxury car divisions in 1987. By entering the ultra-competitive American market with virtually only two Acura luxury models, Honda risked its image. But 30 years later, we see that the brand has not given up its position in the luxury car market. Take a look at the 2021 models. Next year, Acura will introduce two premium sports sedans, the Acura ILX with 201 horsepower and 180 foot-pound of torque. The TLX has 272 horsepower and 280 foot-pound of torque. The brand will also bring a new premium sports hybrid, the RLX, which has a 3.5 liter V6 engine with 310 horsepower and 272 pound-feet of torque. Of the SUVs, the Hexagon Crosser and the 2021 MDX hybrid SUV will be available also. Acura continues the lineup of its premium sports car. They unveiled the 2021 NSX Hybrid Supercar in Long Beach Blue. The name stands for New Sports Experience. The car boosts meticulous design, the power of a 3.5 liter twin turbo V6 engine that's paired with three electric motors that produce 573 horsepower. The base price for this car is about $160,000. The first NSX entered the scene back in the 1990s. It's been said that Gordon Murray, the designer of the McLaren F1, once bought an NSX. The moment he drove it, he replaced Ferrari, Porsche, Lamborghini with the NSX as his reference benchmark for designing the F1, particularly due to the ride quality and handling suspension. It's safe to say that the company chose the right strategy when you look at its track record. The brand is still achieving outstanding results, and it stands out in the market. The main achievement was the recognition by American consumers that it's not just American or European-made cars that offer luxury experience, but Japanese car makers could too.
The Japanese are known for being conservative in the very best sense of the word. Toyota carries this quality at the heart of the company, both in business and in technology. In fact, it's one of the secrets behind how they've been able to build reliable, durable cars. To Toyota, delivering practicality has been their highest priority, far more important than speed, for example. That's why they approach innovation very conservatively and thoughtfully. On the surface, some might think they're slow to innovation. But actually, they prefer to refine and make small changes over time, rather than make a dramatic leap in technology that's untested. To that end, Toyota studies trends on consumer needs. In other words, they explore features or functions that consumers would find practical and useful. Then they look for ways to improve these features or functions. You could say it's a practical approach to practicality. If the company has any doubts about the practicality of a new feature or is unsure to withstand the test of time, it will conduct further research. Here's what I mean about practicality and customer needs. Did you know that the inner ribs of Hilux wheels manufactured in Brazil for the Toyota pickups are about 5 millimeters thicker than the ribs of Hilux wheels manufactured in Thailand? Why is that? Well, that's because Toyota studied potholes in Brazil and found they were 20% larger than those in Thailand. Can you imagine a company rep with a measuring tape in hand measuring potholes in Brazil and Thailand? just to ensure that customers never complain about needing to change their wheels or suspension in less than 100,000 miles. It's hard to believe Toyota goes this far, but it's true. Another example. Did you know that Toyota also closely monitors driving behaviors in different countries? That's because they want to ensure their cars are practical and reliable for each market location. For instance, in South Africa, an average driver might be less likely to slow down when he sees stones up ahead in the road. That's why, for that market region, Toyota makes shock absorbers that are 2 millimeters thicker than in most other countries. Or let's go to Hanoi, Vietnam. In that region, an average driver might not consider the curb or sidewalk as an obstacle. That's why for that region, Toyota cars usually have tires with thicker sidewalls, just for those drivers who drive over curbs. Yet another example. For tropical countries, Toyota likes to place air intakes about 15 millimeters higher since those regions are more prone to floods. And why does Toyota Edios in India have waterproof volume knobs? That's because Toyota company reps, who spent six months in 10 different states in India, came to the conclusion that most car services in India use soap to clean the interiors, so they had to make them waterproof. Here's yet another one. Toyota modified its transmission oil cooler in the United Arab Emirates because if the drivers in that region would use one from say Germany, it could ruin their transmission due to their specific climate. This is the very philosophy why North American Toyotas are so rarely exported to Asia and vice versa. Put simply, if something will make their cars more practical to a market and reduce the failure rate of their cars, then Toyota will spend the time to understand the market need and then modify the parts to meet the market need so you can appreciate how Toyota's attention to detail pays off. Toyota's second secret to reliability is Jidoka. It's a Japanese word that means automation with a human touch. And this has an incredible impact on why Toyota cars and parts rarely fail. To explain what this is, you need to understand what most other car makers do, which is to automate the entire process of making a car. But Toyota's secret is that they do the very opposite. Toyota engineers first design hand build and hand assemble all parts. Only after they've refined it do they put it through an automated process. What does that achieve? Well, this guarantees that every part of a Toyota car is nearly perfect. Then Toyota replicates it and reuses the parts across many different car models. That's why Toyota models often share the same engines and gearboxes, because it's tried, tested, and true. Everything just fits and works. And that brings us to their third secret to reliability. Kaizen. Kaizen translates to continuous improvement or change for the better. Basically, it means to change or to fix something even if it slows you down. So you can see how the good gets better and the better becomes best. In practice, any Toyota employee, regardless of title or position, can stop a production line if they see an improvement that can be made or a problem that must be fixed. Then the team works together to find the best solution and then they implement it. In fact, this is the whole Toyota production system. 
Managers, employees, and even ordinary workers on an assembly line are instructed, trained, and encouraged to focus not on production volume or early delivery, but on production quality. Toyota does this because they want to identify and address problems right on the production line, rather than releasing faulty cars and later recalling defective parts. This ensures that Toyota cars are problem-free before leaving the factory, which further ensures increased reliability on the road. Want to know if Kaizen is really effective? Well, they say imitation is the greatest flattery. So, the fact that major car makers have also started implementing Kaizen in their production just goes to show how effective it is. Toyota understands that consistently delivering high-quality, reliable cars far outweighs and makes up for any short-term losses of production volume. So what do you do if you're Toyota and you've nearly perfected practicality, function, and reliability? What's next? Now you'll probably focus on performance, namely speed. The latest results from WRC and Le Mans races further prove that Toyota is capable of speed. Last year, 2020, the Toyota Gazoo racing team completed the WRC rally in Turkey, which is among the most important races in the world. Turkey's difficult gravel stages and high temperature didn't stop Toyota from claiming a second win for their brand, winning three of the top five races. GR Super Sport Hypercar this car was first shown on the public track for the start of the race. Toyota said their goal wasn't to turn a sports car into a racing car, but rather to build a sports car from a racing car so it can actively compete. They took the twin-turbo V6 engine in the Toyota Hybrid System Racing THSR and gave them a new smooth shape. Their goal has been to create the next generation supercar that delivers maximum power and environmental performance through a combination of highly effective EV system and a burning engine. If you like this episode, please share this video. Thanks for your support.